tonight on KGW News. When will live music and theater return to Oregon? This is an industry that is on the operating table right now and it is in critical condition. COVID vaccine appointments go from tough to get to wide open at sites all around the area. Plus, I watched every day as my kids went further and further down the unnecessary road of instability. Some Oregon lawmakers introduce a bill to force schools to get back to normal next year. Then, from cleaning up the city to defunding police, a closer look at what's inside the Portland budget proposal. Good evening, thanks for being with us tonight. And we start with a trip back to the theater. Several Broadway shows are now scheduled to return to Portland this fall. But as Catherine Cook reports, there's still no new guidance from the state on reopening performing arts venues. Whoever said the show must go on never could have predicted this pandemic. For more than a year, theaters from coast to coast have stood empty. That includes Portland Five Centers for the Arts, with the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall and Keller Auditorium. Frozen was the last production to shine here before its run was cut short in March 2020. Everything else followed. It just sort of went away one day. Corey Brunish is a Broadway producer and splits his time between New York and Portland. According to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, the show will go on starting September 14th. That's when he said Broadway would reopen to full capacity. Brunish says cast, crew, and quite possibly audience members will all need to be vaccinated, keeping safety their first priority. We should be fairly far along in 131 days with our vaccinations. And, uh, and Oregon, too. As long as the numbers are up on the vaccinations, I feel as though theater can indeed come back. We are just really hopeful and, because things are happening so much faster than we dreamed. Robin Williams is executive director for Portland Five Centers for the Arts. She's excited to welcome back the Broadway Across America touring season this fall. Right now, the season opens September 28th with Jesus Christ Superstar, followed by Mean Girls in November. And while the schedule is posted, they can't talk about what it's going to look like inside the theater, if they indeed open, because frankly, they don't know yet. In the meantime, you know, we just keep hoping for some guidelines for ourselves so that we can plan. Industry leaders say that not knowing has had a massive impact on the state's performing arts economy. It's a very fragile ecosystem, the touring world. Jim Brunberg owns Mississippi Studios. His concert schedule includes performers who've had to reschedule three to four times. He hopes the fall dates in place now will hold. Brunberg also started the Independent Venue Coalition. He says for many other Oregon concert venues and festivals, it's too late to book talent. Oregon has kind of fallen off the map. Uh, people are avoiding it like the plague, um, no pun intended. It's really hard for musicians to plan a tour through Oregon because we don't have any guidance right now. For Corey Brunish, bringing back live performances is deeply personal. They say that we don't love music because of the way it sounds, but because of the way it makes us feel. It's why for him and so many others, the show really must go on. Katherine Cook, KGW News. In our area, it's becoming a lot easier to get a COVID vaccine appointment right now compared to just a few weeks ago. But we're also starting to get some national attention for rising case numbers. Pat Doris looks at the context behind it all. At Oregon's busiest vaccination center, the Oregon Convention Center, demand has suddenly dropped by as much as 20%. At its peak, the center vaccinated an incredible 8,000 people a day. Wednesday, it was only 6,400. And for once, says Kaiser Permanente COO Wendy Watson, the reason is not a shortage of vaccine, it's a shortage of people. So now's the time. We've got the easy scheduling link on the All for Oregon website, and now we're allowing walk-in starting tomorrow. Are you surprised at how fast it's dropped off? It's pretty consistent with what we're hearing across the state. So pretty much um, everyone's starting to see a little bit of a softening of demand. Take a look at the scheduling sites and you'll see that is true. It wasn't so long ago that people crashed these sites because so many competed for so few appointment slots. Now you can get one with little delay. Besides the convention center, the mass vaccination site run by Oregon Health and Sciences University at the Portland airport is allowing anyone to show up this weekend appointment or not. 
And another event held by Washington County at the Nike campus this weekend will allow drive-ups as well as appointments for its 1,700 Pfizer doses. At the same time that demand is dropping, Oregon's recent surge in cases has captured the attention of national news outlets. Oregon, perhaps the nation's most dangerous hotspot. So what's going on? Case numbers are relatively high, according to the New York Times COVID tracking project. The average change in the number of cases nationwide over 14 days is actually a negative number, going down 26 percent. But Oregon comes in at a growth of 12 percent, putting it at the fourth highest on the list of U.S. states. Washington state is number 11 with a 4% growth. And when you look at counties in America, Umatilla, Oregon is number one for the percentage increase in hospitalizations with a whopping 656% over the last two weeks, which sounds awful until you see there are 10 people hospitalized in the tiny county. Ali Makdad is an expert in public health metrics and trends with the University of Washington. He said Oregon and Washington have done an excellent job of protecting the population from the virus which means more people are now vulnerable as we all start to relax. He pointed to Texas, which has seen 2.9 million cases as opposed to Oregon's 188,000. But the number of cases per 100,000 in Texas is now dropping 15% over two weeks. That's why you see cases rising here and falling in other parts of the country. People are moving out and about, and we can't afford it in our state simply because we have more people who are susceptible to COVID-19, and you see a rise in cases. They have less people susceptible for COVID-19. They're seeing cases coming down. Pat Doris, KGW News. You can add Clackamas Town Center to the list of places where it's now easier to get the COVID vaccine. It's running a clinic tomorrow, no appointment necessary. Vaccinations are free. This is for Clackamas County residents only. The clinic is in the parking garage at the west end of the mall, but you can walk up if you're not driving. Pfizer's COVID vaccine nearing FDA approval is good news for families. In the early days of the pandemic, kids weren't really getting that sick, but as the older population has gotten their shots, young people are driving transmission. Dr. Brad Olson is the medical director of the Randall Children's Clinic. He says the only way out of the pandemic is to get more shots in more arms, including children. So we're away from herd immunity. And really the only way that we get there is by uh, having vaccines that are available to the entire population. I can't wait to give vaccines to children to and above. I've got three kids. All three of my kids have been immunized. Dr. Olson says he hopes to see vaccines approved for even younger children by the fall. Some Oregon lawmakers took to the steps of the Capitol today to announce a new bill that would require all schools to open for in-person learning in the fall. It mandates what most districts are already planning to do next year, which is to return to full-time learning in the classroom. Republican sponsors of the bill say the governor and Department of Education have changed the rules too many times. And that means that our schools might want to reopen, but if the Department of Education comes in again and changes the rules, it could affect that. We need to give them certainty, and this bill does that. Sponsors call the bill bipartisan, but there were no Democrats at a news conference today by the Capitol. House Republicans say Senator Betsy Johnson, a Democrat from Scappoose, has signed on as a co-sponsor. There is a budget battle in Portland over the city's new street response team. Instead of police, the city now sends teams of crisis counselors and paramedics to some calls involving mental health and addiction. Problem is, it's only operating in southeast Portland's Lentz neighborhood so far. In his new budget proposal, Mayor Wheeler wants to sign off on money to keep it going there, but wait to spend money to expand it. The mayor wants to review data on the program first. Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, however, is pushing for the expansion. She wants the team to go citywide by next spring. The community is just thirsting for Portland Street response, not only to roll out citywide, but to be successful. So we're having an opportunity to collectively make sure that the budget reflects our values because it is a moral document. The council had previously set aside almost $5 million for a citywide expansion, but most of the money hasn't been spent yet. The issue is when to actually put that plan in motion to expand, and for now, the mayor is saying to hold off. 
Beyond the street response debate, there are plenty of other things to dig through in the mayor's budget. Dan Haggerty has a closer look. The mayor's budget proposal dedicates millions to cleaning up trash and graffiti in the next year and to try and tackle homelessness. Let's take a look. The mayor has plans to spend $5.7 million to clean up trash in parks and neighborhoods across the city. 300,000 of that would go toward paying homeless people $20 an hour to clean up trash. Another 1.2 million would be set aside to clean up camps. He also wants to allocate millions to helping with homelessness including $2 million going toward building new shelters, another $2 million for hygiene stations around the city, and $250,000 specifically set aside for transgender people who are homeless. There's also $3.4 million in the mayor's budget for cleaning up the graffiti that's all over the place, and half a million for businesses that have had vandalism and damage over the past year. The Portland police, well, they aren't going to be seeing an increase in money. In fact, if the mayor's proposal is approved, they'll be losing a whole lot of it. Overall, PPB would lose about $9 million. Wheeler does want to give PPB a one-time influx of $5 million in order to quickly hire 30 new police officers. That's because there's already a shortage of officers, and the Bureau says they're going to lose even more of them over the next few years. And the mayor wants to add 22 unarmed community safety officers. They would respond to non-emergency calls during the day. The mayor says the city has lost more than $100 million in the last year, but that we're getting federal money to help us out. Commissioners are now going to review the mayor's proposal, and they're set to vote on it next month. We'll let you know what happens. Tiger police say they're expanding their body camera program so that all officers will have them. They've been looking at an expansion for years and just got city council approval to move forward. It adds corroborating evidence um, for us, so um, it helps shed light on the occurrences, what we're seeing, um, what people are telling us, how, how everybody's interacting. Um, being able to show from our point of view how quickly these things happen, and sometimes we don't have the opportunity to achieve the ends that we all want to see. We have to react to what's occurring and we have to save lives. The cameras automatically activate during specific events like an officer drawing their gun or turning on the police lights in their car. In addition to body cameras, the department is also getting upgrades to in-car video systems, tasers and other technology.